So, the first, I'm just going to pan around here. The first track we need to switch is where that covered hopper car is. That's the one that's a trailing point move when we're westbound here. So we're going to do that first. So, pull up here. Just want the hopper cars, of course. And then I usually sort of lay out my car cards here. You'll see in a sec. I don't have the face up with any card boxes yet. That will come eventually. You can see the front of the layout is still pretty bare. So once we get past the switch here, Thanks for hanging in here with me. I mean, this is the most exciting thing, I'm sure. But hey, you all wanted a longer video, or at least one of you did. We'll see if my dad actually watches the whole thing sometime. Is this entertaining? <laughs> so, pick up our gray hopper car here. And I think the last time I did a live video, I was switching Redwood Falls and I kind of explained a bit of my philosophy on operating my railroad. Of not being in too big of a hurry. Again, everybody has to do things their own way, but... For me, I know that the top speed on the Redwood Falls branch was probably somewhere between 5 and 10 miles an hour, so you're not going to be setting any speed records. And that's part of the appeal of it to me, is I don't, it's not a huge railroad, so I don't need to operate it at 1,000 miles an hour. Okay, push that back plenty far, I guess got to talking, but that's part of what makes it fun for me is to do it somewhat prototypically in speed and, and like I said, it would be, it would be boring if I came down here and just ran it really quickly. I don't, does that make sense? <laughs> when most people would go, no, it's actually boring to watch it go really slowly. <laughs> I think it's the other way around. I think it would be boring to have it over with way too quickly. So I don't have one of those scale speedometers. I've seen those before. That would be useless because I just... Figure this is slow enough, but maybe I'm still operating at too fast. I don't know what five, seven, ten scale miles an hour looks like. Slow, that's what it looks like. It looks slow. And I will say, the uh, one thing I cannot recommend enough is standardizing your couplers. I didn't convert all of my couplers to the KD coupler soon enough, and it used to be a lot more frustrating to operate with inconsistent coupling. And
it's nice to be and again I don't know I if it's not operating right I change it that's right Mike slow and steady Operating slowly also really cuts down on derailments, actually. My track isn't, I mean, I intentionally made it undulating so it looks kind of run down and worn out. It's not supposed to be smooth 40, 50 mile an hour track. But I found that operating slowly, the, the cars and locomotives, and this is Code 55 track. I know some people have horror stories of code 55 track saying they'll never use it it's too finicky but honestly i changed i did change the wheel sets on all the cars i haven't changed them on the locomotives because i can't find wheel sets with you know the gears on them but but all the cars have uh more scale not completely scaled but they're the narrow tread wheel sets and they operate really well i don't i don't generally have too much trouble with that so all right so we got our two cars dropped off there we've got our gray hopper car that we picked up and now we'll pull into town to uh switch the rest of the cars from the east end, so we'll have to run around our train here. And this is, I think, the track arrangement that I have here is pretty prototypical for what was here. It would have been longer end to end. So if I was gonna make it to scale of what was actually in Redwood Falls, I probably would have had to use the whole 30 foot wall just for the town. But I'll move you down here just a little bit. You can see a couple things back here. So there's going to be another elevator here eventually. And then, sorry about my arm in the way. Then there's going to be back here is where the coal shed is going to be eventually over here. And then way back there is the Redwood Building Center. Again, a local business that I have adopted for the layout, even though I don't even know if it was around in the 1970s. But you can see I've got my snow plow parked back here at the end of the line. Didn't really need that this last winter. It did not snow much here in Redwood Falls, less than what we usually get. But someday, someday maybe we'll run a plow extra. And this switch is one of the ones I did most of the work on instead of Jeremiah. So it's, oh, it made it through it. Sometimes it stutters a little bit there. That's my fault. I'm the one that... Didn't uh, build it quite right, but, or, huh, it's not exactly engage, I guess. Just enough that it makes it, makes it over, so. Uh, all right, so anyway, we'll be back to this end of the layout here in a little bit. And I'm going to remember this time to throw the switch <laughs> at the east end so we don't derail. All right. So... What I'm going to do now... Let's go ahead and get all our empty cars 
off of the elevator track here. Or I guess the cars at the elevator would be loaded now. We're going to deliver some empty cars. Maybe you can see this better this way. So this is where the team track is going to be. Eventually there will be a platform there for loading and unloading various things. Mostly unloading. And then the Redwood Co-op elevator here. And then we've got one more boxcar back here at what is going to eventually be called the Redwood Valley Growers Elevator. So those three empty cars, or two loads and one empty. The team track car is one that I had a way bill of produce to be delivered. Thanks to my friends over at Perry's Hobbies in Morgan, Minnesota. They own Becker's Super Value grocery store, and he was telling me one time he remembers the Super Value grocery stores all getting some oranges or other shipments in that they would have them delivered to Redwood Falls in a reefer, and then all the grocery store owners or operators would, would drive to Redwood and get their produce off of the off of the refrigerated car. And there you can see this car is one of my first attempts at weathering. So it turned out all right. Not quite as shiny as the others. All right. Now we're going to couple up to the caboose. Because we have to have the caboose at the right end of the train, the correct end of the train when we go back, right? I, that. Again, I don't know if that makes a difference to me, but it only looks right with the caboose at the end of the train. So we'll grab that. this kind of this way so you can see a little bit better of what we're going to be doing here. I guess I could turn it this way so you can see back the other direction. Okay. So we'll push these cars past the elevator and team track switch there. And that's where we're going to build our train to return to Sleepy Eye. So 
So now we can go get the rest of our train. And finish up switching everything. And we should be able to just kind of, well, like I said, we'll have to switch around the Santa Fe and the Erie boxcar are in the wrong order. But we can do that easily enough. So it's kind of amazing to me when you, I mean, it really doesn't take a lot to make a fairly interesting operating railroad. This shelf is no more than two feet wide at its widest. So here at Redwood Falls, it's two feet wide. Most of the rest of the layout is only one foot wide. And I have, let's see, one, two, three, four, four, five, six, seven spots, to, seven or eight spots for cars here in Redwood Falls, plus the one in, in Gilfillan. So you're talking about less than 10 car spots. Um, and never, never operating with more than 10 cars just because of the size of the railroad but it can still take me the better part of an hour or more to do this, like you're finding out. And um, yeah, makes it pretty interesting. And as I've done a little more research, I really don't think this, I'm calling it a concrete place. I don't think that's, that track maybe didn't actually exist. I thought I had seen it in an aerial photograph when I was designing, before I designed the railroad. I've gone back and looked again. I don't think it's actually there, but that's okay. I've left it in because it does make switching at least a little more complicated to have, you know, one, one facing point move or, you know, you know what I'm saying. One one switch or one siding that's going the opposite direction of all the others. Just a little thing like that makes you think just a little bit more and makes it just a little bit more complicated, more interesting, I would say. Right. So these two here are going to go to the elevator. So we want the... I need to push these back just a little bit more. And then while we push these back, sometimes I'll just kind of get my car cards in a little bit better order here. These are the empty cars, or the loaded cars from the elevator we picked up. So... Push these back here. Usually spot the easternmost car right in front of the elevator. Because then as they load the cars, they would get pushed towards this end of the, of the siding.
that for the team track. So we'll put that there for our the two for the elevator and then our flat car here at the team track. And that just leaves these last two cars here, which we've got Anderson Farms and the Redwood Fuel, but they're in the wrong, wrong direction. Yeah, Mike, if I could, if I could do a Dutch drop. So I think I would have to program some more momentum into my uh, decoder here before I could do a Dutch drop. <laughs> and I'd also have to get it moving a lot faster than probably five or ten miles an hour to be able to do that. I don't think I have a brakeman that's brave enough to hang on into the car while I'm while I'm operating it. All right, so we're going to put the Santa Fe car here. Leave it for just a sec. So we can get the Erie car behind it. Mike, have you ever actually performed a Dutch drop? Or a, I guess some railroads call it what, like a flying switch? I'm pretty sure you'd be, uh, well, maybe on the Red River Valley in Western, you can still do that without getting into, into any trouble. Pretty sure on the CP that was out of the rule book a long time ago. <laughs> Maybe not, though. Works fine at 10, just need three people? Yeah. Now this is a one-man operation here. <laughs> I mean, there has to be, that has to be a fun thing to try. I mean, I, <laughs> scary, I, I, I may be scary, but I would, I mean, work has to be interesting sometimes, right? <laughs> sure. I mean, you just think about the way that railroading used to be. I think we all feel, I mean, even for those of us who don't work in the industry, you still did it at CP in the early 2000s. Well, that's more recent than I would have guessed. But it seems like a lot of those things that took skill and, uh, I mean, it still takes skill. Don't, I, don't get me wrong. I'm, that. That wasn't exactly what I wanted to say, but there was like an art to it. You know, now it, it feels like, at least from what I hear from a lot of employees, the railroad is taking as much of that away from employees as they can and giving it to managers and computers who are making more and more decisions. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. There's something, I think that would have been the appeal too about, <laughs> about working on a, on something like the Redwood Falls branch in the 1970s. I mean, I can just imagine the guys who held this, uh, who held this job probably had some of the higher seniority. I mean, I guess if they wanted to work out of Tracy, Minnesota, you know, some guys that probably were going back to the steam era, maybe, or at least the early diesel era. And you know, you'd probably be out here in a place like Morgan or Redwood Falls. And I doubt that there was a lot of managerial oversight unless something went wrong. <laughs> I mean, I think that would be one of the appeal and maybe it still is for railroaders that can find jobs that are a little bit kind of under the radar or off the radar entirely. But... I don't know, it's kind of like being sent out to do a job and being trusted that you'll figure it out, <laughs> you know, that you'll, this is what you have, this is the job that needs to get done, 
and instead of micromanaging every single detail of how you're going to do this, we trust you to use your knowledge and ingenuity to do the work safely and efficiently. Or perhaps sometimes not so safely. <laughs> But at least without causing bodily harm to anyone or doing damage to any property. I don't know. Seems like we have less tolerance for those things in our in our society right now. Of trusting people to do work <laughs> without being micromanaged to death. So maybe I'll have to give it a try sometime, Mike. I'll program some more momentum into the locomotive. And I'll see what I can do. Or maybe some of you more experienced model railroaders out there will be able to tell me, hey, we do that all the time on my rail. I don't, can anyone do a, a flying switch or a Dutch drop of a, of a facing point turnout? I, 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 excuse me. I honestly don't know how you would make it work <clears throat> unless it was on a grade on your layout. I just feel like the somehow uncoupling, because it's so hard to uncouple a car on the fly, unless you had a magnet under the track, I suppose, that could uncouple it as it goes by. But even then, with these KD couplers, if you leave the magnetic pins on them or the metal pins on them, I think if the couplers are under tension, they don't really uncouple, do they? You always kind of have to give it some slack in order for it to uncouple. He were hoping I, I'd figure it out. I just, yeah, I just don't know how you get it to work. That's well, something to think about. I mean, you'd have to, <laughs> it probably would take more coordination to do it on a model railroad than it does on the real railroad. No, that's, I mean, even with three guys, how would you, you'd have to have one person throw, throwing the switch, one person uncoupling the car, and one person running the locomotive. I mean, I'm assuming that that's the three people that you're talking about that you'd need. And I think you would probably, I don't, I don't think I'm coordinated enough to do all three of those things at one time. But I don't know. Might be worth a try. All right, well, we're delivering our last cars here. We picked up that Northern Pacific boxcar from the Redwood Building Center way down here. Move you back this way so you can see where we're gonna be dropping these things off. It's one of the things um, one of the things I like about the way I designed this layout, and I did this intentionally, some people don't do this, but I intentionally had these grain elevators in front because I like, I know that it's kind of a pain to have to reach around them to uncouple things, but Even for a shelf layout, I, I like the feeling of having, you know, some scenery or structures between the viewer and the track. It just, it just gives a little more interest to, you know, the train kind of disappearing for a second. So one at the switch, one on the car to ride the brake, and one on the locomotive to pull the pin, plus an engineer. Okay, so three in addition to the engineer. Well, there's no, it's no wonder that the railroad doesn't let people, I bet the railroad stopped doing it, not because, you know, they were worried about safety or anything. They just didn't want to pay for that many people to be working, right? <laughs> I mean, once you no longer have brakemen, it gets tougher. All right, so now we've got, but yeah, so I just kind of like the, I like having the, the elevators here in front to kind of break up the view a little bit. All right, that's the last car to drop off at the feed shed back there. So
So we'll get all of our car cards in order here. So we've got, move this back this way one more time. So you can see the whole train. So we've got, and this is, you'll be able to see on the, on the car cards, it says when empty return to a certain location. And I just kind of, for Northern Pacific, I used Dilworth, Minnesota. It doesn't really mean anything. I just thought it was kind of fun. So anyway, um, we've got Northern Pacific, our CNW empty concrete car. A box car from Gilfillan, empty refrigerator car. These would technically be loaded again. If I did the, if I did the four cycle waybill, you know, I could have it where well now that it's loaded, it's going to go that way, and go somewhere else off the layout. But I just, it was easier for me to just have the waybills and then just know I'm going to be picking up whatever cars are here are going to go back. Again, this is what I've debated about with the switch list is maybe it makes sense that then I could have like, well, you need to spot these cars, hold these cars, you know, have an off spot location for some of them, that sort of thing. But I don't know. To me, it was just simpler to do it this way with just the cars if there's cars there, they're going to go back to Sleepy Eye, and I don't leave any of them here. But. All right, so I move the, move the camera one last time here, get my car cards. I'll move you down here a bit so you can see the train depart Redwood Falls. This is actually... Kind of one of my favorite views, if you don't mind the vacuum cleaner and stuff over there. I like being able to see the train come out of Redwood Falls and come across the irrigation ditch. There was a long curve from the northwest to the southeast so oriented this direction on this side of redwood falls there was a, and there was a trestle sort of part way along that um, along that curve but there wasn't an s curve like i have i had to put it this way just because well that's the space i had so well, Lindy's watching from upstairs. Hi, sweetheart. I'm almost done. <laughs> then I'll keep helping with laundry and other cleanup from our camping trip. But at least this part of it, that, that curve to the, to the southeast again, the tracks basically ran northwest to southeast from Redwood Falls down towards Sleepy Eye. So, and we're back to Gilfillan again. Let you hear the locomotive one more time. Eventually, there will be a you know, an elevator at a small older wooden elevator there at Gilfillan. And I'll probably put another rural grade crossing here. All right. We've made the long trip. <laughs> 
just 30 feet from end to end. Doesn't take very long to get there. But here we are back in Sleepy Eye. Or the staging yard. Yes, yes, that's exactly how you know that you're at the end of the line is when you, um, actually when you hit the derail at the, before you, you come onto the main line there in Sleepy Eye, uh, you just know, well, we're done. Our day is done. So, that's about it. Usually I'll disconnect the power and run it back onto the, on the siding there where I have the other power, but that's it. Then we'd have everything kind of back to where we started with the cut of cars here on the main, and I'd go back to what we just did. So anyway, that's it. Kind of anticlimactic. Here we are back where we started, but um, anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Thanks for those of you who made, who left some comments. If, you, if you're watching this when it's not live and you want to leave some comments, I'll try to read those later on um, and respond. But I really appreciate all of, the, all of the support you guys give me on the Facebook page. Uh, I really appreciate all the likes and comments. It kind of keeps me inspired to keep going. And you guys have great ideas, great suggestions. So yeah, you're welcome, Mike. Thanks for thanks for hanging out, and we'll uh, we'll do this again sometime. But uh, yeah, again, hope you hope you're having a good weekend, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks everybody. Uh, bye bye.